In the last episode, we have introduced a simplified model to the Schrodinger equation. This model, called Hartree-Fock model, required to solve a set of equations which are called the Hartree-Fock equations. In this episode, we will present you how we can find approximations to the solution of the Hartree-Fock problem by introducing finite bases and solving the problem on the finite dimensional space spanned by all these basis functions. In our metaphor, let us remind the image of the cat. The image of the cat was the model, and we have different types of models, the Schrodinger equation, the Hartree-Fock equation. It is like we have two kinds of lenses, a lens with a very good quality, which is an expensive one, and a lens with a poor quality, which is not expensive. So we have these two models. But now we don't have a picture, we don't have a photo. We need to digitalize it. And depending on the number of pixels you use in order to record the picture, you will have a different quality of the image. If you use few pixels, it will not be expensive to store them, but it will be a poor quality. If you have more pixels, then the quality of the image will be much better, but it will be expensive to store. Ben, as an appetizer for this episode, can you remind us rapidly about the Hartree-Fock model? Sure. The Hartree-Fock equations are given by find C0, which is a set of orbitals such that the Fock operator around phi0 applied to any orbital phi j is equal to epsilon j phi j, where epsilon j is an eigenvalue, therefore, of the Fock operator. Further, we require all orbitals still to be orthonormal within each other. The action of the Fock operator f psi for any set of orbitals psi acting on phi j is given by. So we see first again the part which corresponds to the kinetic energy. So it is minus one half of the Laplacian acting on phi j plus again the multiplication of phi j by the external potential created by the nuclei, and then again the two terms arising from the electron-electron interaction. The Hartree-Fock equation consists therefore of a nonlinear eigenvalue problem where the nonlinearity is due to the dependency of the Fock operator on the set of the solutions phi zero. In this episode, we will explain you how to discretize these equations, meaning that we will write these equations in a finite dimensional space. Then we will see how we solve this nonlinearity or this nonlinear eigenvalue problem, and especially look for a very commonly used algorithm in theoretical chemistry. Now, Yvon has prepared some explanations about the discretization. The space on which the Hartree-Fock problem is posed is, a priori, an infinite dimensional space. Since its solution cannot be computed exactly on this space, we need to do an approximation and refer to a finite dimensional space. The simplification from an infinite dimensional space to a finite dimensional space is called the discretization. In order to represent each orbital phi j of the wave function in a discrete way, we introduce a finite dimensional setting of n delta basis function that are denoted like chi mu so that we approximate each orbital by a linear combination of those functions. It reads, phi j is approximated by phi j delta equal to the sum from mu equal to 1 to n delta of c mu j chi mu. The c mu j have an index mu for the basis function and an index j for the orbital. Given a basis set, the goal now is to determine the coefficient c mu j for each orbital. The set of all these coefficients c mu j is stored 
in a rectangular matrix, capital C. Remember that in the general setting, the matrix C is with complex coefficient. But here, we have no external magnetic field, so we can assume that the matrix is with real coefficients. So the matrix belongs to R to the n delta cross n. Note that in the general case, the basis function chi mu are not orthonormal, but in some cases they can be. Further, given any set of discrete orbitals, psi 1 delta, psi 2 delta, psi n delta, we can build the correspondence latter determinant, which is denoted like a ket, psi 1 delta, psi 2 delta, psi n delta. This consists in the discrete artifoc counterpart of the wave function. Let us now remind the form of the artifoc energy that we ended to at the last episode. So we read here again the artifoc energy, the psi being a set of orbital. The energy is, uh, as you remember, the sum of uh, the kinetic energy, the potential due to the nuclei, and then the two complex nonlinear contribution due to the repulsion of the electrons. The Artrifoc equation that Ben has reminded at the beginning of this video is the Euler-Lagrange of the minimization problem for this energy under the constraint that the orbitals are orthonormal. The discretization of the problem amounts to minimize that very same Artrifoc energy on the set of discrete orbitals satisfying the orthonormality constraint. So it reads, Psi zero delta, the solution to our problem, is the Armin over all Psi delta satisfying the orthonormality constraint of the Artrifoc energy applied to Psi delta. Here, the discrete artifact space is defined, as it's written here, V artifact delta is the set of all psi delta, psi 1 delta, psi 2 psi delta, psi n delta, where psi j delta is the discrete sum of c mu j chi mu, the c mu j belonging to R, for every j, for every mu, and we have the orthogonality constraint, the bracket of psi j delta with psi i delta is equal to delta ij. Not this, as it seems natural, this problem corresponds to the minimization of the Schrödinger equation on the set of all slatter determinants built from a set of discrete orbitals. So we also have that the energy at the ground state, the E Artrifoc energy of phi zero delta is uh, the infimum of the Schrödinger energy computed over all discrete Artrifoc determinants. The Euler-Lagrange system corresponding to the minimization of the above Artrifoc energy over the discrete orbital is, of course, not solution of the equation that Ben presented. It is a discretized version of this system that corresponds to the discrete Artrifoc equation, where we want to find a phi zero delta, a set of atomic orbitals, phi one delta, phi n delta, so that in the variational sense, for every psi delta, the bracket of psi delta with f phi zero delta applied to phi j delta is equal to the eigenvalue epsilon j delta, psi delta, phi j delta for every j going from 1 to n with, of course, the orthonormality constraint. This is called the Galerkin approximation or the variational approximation of the problem, which doesn't mean that f indexed phi zero delta applied to phi j delta is equal to epsilon j delta, phi j delta, but the projection P delta of phi zero delta applied to phi j delta is equal to epsilon j phi j. Here, pi delta represents the projection orthogonal 
for the L2 scalar product on the discrete space. And we can set f delta is equal to pi delta f, like here. With this notation, the discrete Hartree-Fock equation reads find phi zero delta equal to phi one delta, phi two delta, phi n delta, such that f index phi zero delta with a superscript delta, so it is the projection of the Fock operator applied to phi j delta equal to epsilon j delta phi j delta for every j equal from 1 to n, with again with the orthonormality condition. Now that the problem is discretized, meaning that the approximation is represented by a finite dimensional space, we can write it in a matrix form. Let us first consider the constraint. Writing the orbital phi j delta as a sum of the basis function translates the scalar product between two orbitals into a double sum. It reads for i j equal 1 to n, delta i j equal to the bracket between phi j delta and phi i delta is the sum of mu from 1 equal 1 to n delta of cj mu chi mu. This is the bra part. And the ket part is the sum from mu equal 1 to n delta of c i mu chi mu. So the two sums can go out of the bracket. The coefficients cj mu and c i mu can also go out of the bracket. And this contribution is equal to the double sum on mu and mu of cj mu, ci mu, the bra ket of chi mu, chi mu. The Kronecker symbol means that uh, this is equal to 1 if i equal to j and 0 otherwise. Since the discrete basis function chi mu don't need to be orthonormal, it is necessary to define the so-called overlap matrix which contains all scalar product between the discrete basis function. This is the overlap matrix S index mu nu equal to the bracket to the scalar product of chi mu times chi nu. Note that this overlap matrix is generally known as the mass matrix in the numerical analysis community. With this definition, the scalar product between two basis functions can be written as a sum of matrix coefficient. And we read here for every i and j going from 1 to n, delta ij, the bracket between phi j delta and phi i delta, is equal to what was written previously and is equal to the double sum on mu and nu of c mu j, c nu i, times the overlap matrix S mu nu. Recall that in the rectangular C matrix, the GIF column corresponds to the coefficient associating to the GIF orbital in the discrete basis. Therefore, the number of rows in the C matrix is the number of basis function that we are considering here that is denoted as curly n delta. The number of colons in C is equal to the number of orbitals we are considering, and which is equal to n. With this notation, we easily see that the constraint of orthonormality reads for every i and j, delta ij is equal to the entry of the matrix C transpose SC of index ij. So to wrap up, the constraint can be written in a matrix form as C transpose SC is equal to the identity IN composed of 1 on the diagonal and 0 everywhere else. Let us now focus on the discrete eigenvalue problem that results from the minimization on the discrete space of the Hartree-Fock energy. Let us remind it that it treats for every psi delta, psi delta f indexed by phi zero delta, phi j delta is equal to epsilon j delta, psi delta, phi j delta for every j equal to 1 to n. 
If we remember that the discrete space is spanned, is spanned by discrete function chi index nu, this is equivalent for every mu equal 1 to curly n delta, chi mu f index phi delta phi j delta is equal to epsilon j chi mu phi j delta for j equal, for j equal to 1 to n. On the right hand side, we have the scalar product, so this can be written with the overlap matrix. But on the left hand side, it is much more complicated, and we have to look a little bit more to the Fock operator applied to another basis function. So, for instance, given a set of orbitals psi delta equal to psi 1 delta psi n delta we can consider the Fock operator on this Psi delta. So it reads chi mu f indexed by Psi delta of phi j delta. So this is chi mu of f indexed by Psi delta applied to the sum of C nu i chi nu. Again, by linearity, we can extract the sum and the coefficient And this is equal to the sum from nu equal 1 to curly n delta of c nu i chi nu f index psi delta chi nu. Okay, so we thus have to compute the matrix element chi nu f index psi delta chi nu. Okay, the Fock operator, you remember, is composed of uh, four parts. So let's focus now on the linear part, the two first part of the Fock operator. So the linear part is minus one half of Laplacian plus V. The corresponding matrix coefficient are given by H indexed by mu nu is equal to the bracket again of chi nu minus one half of Laplacian plus V chi nu, which is written as an integral one half of the integral over R3 of gradient of chi nu gradient of chi nu, which is obtained by integration by part from the Laplacian, plus the integral over R3 of V times chi mu chi nu. Now, in the Fock operator, we have the two remaining terms. So let us look at how they read when the operator is applied to a chi mu function. This is the sum from i equal 1 to n of the integral over R3 of the psi i delta of y to the square divided by x minus y multiply applied to chi mu of x. But the integral is taken over the variable dy minus the sum from i equal to n of the integral of psi i delta of y chi mu of y divided by x minus y dy multiplied by psi i delta of x. Maybe take your time to read this equation. In order to derive the associated matrix element, we need to perform the integral of this expression with the basis function chi nu. This reads now the integral over R3 of chi nu of x, the sum from i equal 1 to n of the integral over psi i delta of y to the square divided by x minus y dy, multiplied by chi mu of x dx minus an equivalent expression corresponding to the second form. Assuming now that uh, the set of orbital psi delta that appears in the Fock operator f indexed by psi delta is given by psi j delta is uh, the sum from mu equal to 1 to curly n delta of c mu j hat chi mu, then we can develop uh, The expression that you can read here, and please take your time to read it, and that is at the end equal to the double sum on nu prime equal 1 to curly n delta, mu prime equal 1 to n delta of k 
chi nu prime of y chi mu prime of y time the nu prime mu prime entry of the matrix c hat c hat transpose. So with this expansion, we can write more easily the third term appearing in the Hartree-Fock variational formulation. So you remember, it was the integral over R3 of chi nu, the sum corresponding to the psi delta uh, wave function, multiplied by chi mu. So with the above expression, we introduce a 4 by 4 tensor, the mu nu times the mu nu prime, and the expression is the sum over nu prime, the sum over mu prime, these indexes going from 1 to curly and delta, of the 4 by 4 tensor product, mu nu, mu prime, mu prime, applied to the nu prime, mu prime entry of the matrix C hat, C hat transpose where the 4 by 4 tensor mu nu mu prime nu prime is equal to the double integral over r3 times r3 of chi mu of x chi nu of x chi mu prime of y chi nu prime of y divided by x minus y dx dy. In the same way we can expand, we can write the fourth contribution in the Hartree-Fock variational formulation, and it reads the integral over chi nu of x times the contribution of psi i delta chi nu divided by x minus y applied to psi i delta is equal to the double sum of the same tensor sum on mu prime, mu prime equal to 1 to n delta of the tensor times the mu prime, mu prime entry of the matrix C hat, C hat transpose. To summarize, the matrix form of the Fock operator in the psi delta wave function is written like F d hat of mu nu is equal to H mu nu associated to the linear part, plus the contribution of the two nonlinear parts, the sum from mu prime equal to 1 to n delta, sum over mu prime equal 1 to n delta, of the tensor form mu nu mu prime nu prime, minus mu nu prime mu prime nu, applied to the d entries index mu prime mu prime with a hat, with d hat equal to c hat, c hat transpose. And remember that the c hat are the coefficient associating to, associated to the psi delta. The 4 by 4 tensor mu nu mu prime nu prime with the mu nu mu prime mu prime going from 1 to n delta is a complex contribution as a consequence of the nonlinearity of the Hartree-Fock problem. Fortunately, this complexity can be simplified by noticing many symmetries. Indeed, we have mu nu mu prime mu prime equal to mu nu mu nu prime equal to mu nu prime mu prime nu is equal to mu prime nu prime mu nu. This symmetry allows to reduce the storage, the computational cost to assemble the matrix F D at just a little bit. However, the computational cost is still of the order of n delta to the power 4. So with all this notation, the problem we want to solve can be written in an algebraic way. The first is the Fock equation. Fdc is equal to Sce, where S is the overlap matrix. We have the normality constraint. C transpose Sc is equal to the identity and D appearing in the first line of the Fock operator is the density matrix, which is a product of C, C transpose. Because the Fock operator we want to apply is on the phi function we are currently computing. In the Fock equation, E corresponds to a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalue epsilon i. 
So we remind that in this formula, we have already applied the unitary transpose that allow to have E as a diagonal matrix. Now we have the discrete equation. So how do we do in practice in order to solve this problem? The equations that Yvon has derived are difficult to solve for one main reason, which is the nonlinearity of the equations. This nonlinearity appears through the D in the Fock equations. This D is the density matrix and depends on the coefficient matrix C through the third equation. Indeed, by definition, the density matrix is equal to C, C transpose. If f of d was a fixed matrix, then the problem would be a linear eigenvalue problem and could be solved more easily. But because of the nonlinearity, the problem is more difficult and in practice, we use an iterative procedure to solve the problem. In fact, the idea is to start from an initial guess of the matrix coefficients C0, then computing the density matrix D0 equal to C0, C0 transpose allows to compute the Fock matrix F of D0 for this particular density matrix. Then we can solve the linear eigenvalue problem with the Fock matrix F of D0 and get new coefficients C1, hopefully better than the initial guess C0. And from there, we compute the new density matrix D1, then the Fock matrix F of D1, and from there, we compute new coefficients C2 by solving the linear eigenvalue problem with the Fock matrix F of D1. We can then compute in a similar way coefficients C3, C4, C5, and so on. At each step, we compute the new coefficient CK by solving a linear eigenvalue problem with a density matrix computed at the previous step DK minus 1. From the new coefficients CK, we can then compute the new density matrix DK. After some iterations, if DK plus 1 is close enough to DK, then dk plus 1 is almost solution to the nonlinear eigenvalue problem. And at this point, we actually consider that the nonlinear eigenvalue problem is solved. The resulting error is called solution error. This algorithm is most commonly known as self consistent field or Ruthen iterations. This can be more compactly written as the numerical scheme that appears now. You see that at each iteration, the nonlinearity is frozen in the Fock matrix, which depends on the matrix computed at the previous step. And this turns the problem into a linear eigenvalue problem at each step. This algorithm works quite well in practice. However, the convergence is not theoretically guaranteed and sometimes the algorithm does not converge. In mathematics, it is also named as Picard iteration or fixed point algorithm. In this setting, the coefficients in the coefficient matrix C depend on the basis chosen for representing the orbitals. So Ben, could you now tell us a bit more about these bases? So far, we didn't mention the precise nature of basis functions that are commonly used for the computations. This is a crucial choice, since it has a large impact on the quality and accuracy of the solution, and it also has an impact on the computational time you need for solving these equations. The first choice of basis functions that is commonly used in theoretical chemistry are the so-called atomic orbitals. These are functions that have a specific radial and angular dependency and are centered at the nuclei of each of the atoms. Different atomic orbitals are defined for each element of the periodic table. 
The intuition behind such an approximation is that orbitals can be well approximated locally around each nuclei by linear combinations of nuclei-centered functions. Then the orbitals are thought as linear combination of atomic orbitals. In short, there is this very commonly known as LCAO. And here we have an illustration where an, or an orbital phi j delta is first given as a sum over all the nuclei with index alpha, then a sum over the local degrees of freedom mu for one nuclei, and then we have co coefficients c times a basis function xi that is centered at the position of the alpha nuclei. The first idea that came up to design atomic orbitals was a very natural one. Hydrogen-like orbitals as basis functions. A simplified version thereof is called Slater-type orbitals. These functions are written in terms of spherical coordinates and have a specific dependency in the radial part. The angular dependency is described by means of spherical harmonics, which are denoted here by YLM. Here you see some examples where we illustrated the dependency on the radial part of such basis functions. The disadvantage of this ansatz is that the bielectronic six-dimensional integrals that we are illustrating here are expensive to compute. Without further simplification, the number of entries of this rank 4 tensor scales as n delta to the 4. A fundamental idea regarding the computational complexity was the introduction of Gaussian type basis functions. The reason is that integrals of Gaussians, products thereof, or Gaussian types polynomials can be computed analytically, which is not possible for general basis functions. This reduces the complexity of the six dimensional bioelectronic integrals to a one dimensional integral only. However, the number of entries of this rank 4 tensor scales still like n delta to the fourth. In practice, however, this value is reduced to O of n delta to the power of 2.7 since the overlap of Gaussians corresponding to far away atoms is negligible. This type of fu basis functions are called Gaussian type orbitals and are used in many quantum chemistry codes. As you can see, these functions are simple polynomials times Gaussian functions of the radial part. Here you see some examples where we illustrate the dependency on the radial part of these Gaussian orbitals. The disadvantage, however, is that the asymptotic behavior of these functions around the origin, so-called cusp, and towards infinity, so-called fall-off, is not correct in contrast to Slater-type orbitals. In consequence, there are many basis functions needed in order to get good quality approximations. It is, however, observed in practice that not so many basis functions are needed. Indeed, only very few linear combinations of Gaussian type orbitals are needed to get good approximations. In general, these linear combinations are called contracted Gaussians and can be pre-computed and predefined once and for all in advance. As you see here, one basis function is already a linear combination of Gaussian type orbitals. Finally, we note, without going into further details, that wavelets can also be used for LCAO approximations. In the case of periodic systems, such as crystals for instance, LCAO, so linear combination of atomic orbitals, can be ineffective. The number of atoms is very large and therefore another type of basis functions is used, Fourier series, also called plane waves which can be used here since we have a periodic setting. In this case, the basis functions are complex exponentials in the form of e to the power of i k dot product x. 
So we have seen some different choices of basis functions commonly used in computational chemistry. We are not going into further details. Instead, we would like to conclude this episode with some remarks about different sources of errors. Let us now introduce some abstract notation in order to perform the numerical analysis of this approximation that we have done. First come the linear eigenvalue problem that uh, traduces the Schrödinger equation that defines implicitly the wave function psi that is written as f of psi equal to zero. This is the electronic Schrödinger equation. As we already stated, this problem is too large to be solved, so we have introduced a model, an approximation, where we are looking for a solution, psi artifoc, solution to the problem f artifoc, psi artifoc, equal to zero. This is the artifoc equation. It is not the original model, so we have a modeling error. In practice, we have to go further in the approximation because this problem cannot be solved exactly. We need to introduce the discretization and we are looking for a solution psi artifoc delta with a tilde solution of f delta artifoc equal to zero. This is the exact solution of the discrete artifoc problem that thus involves the modeling error due to the Artifoc approximation and the discretization error. We need to go further because this psi tilde delta Artifoc is not available, is not computable. Because the problem is nonlinear and we refer to linear algebra in order to solve the eigenvalue problem, so we do not solve exactly this discrete problem after the self-consistent approximation, after the discretization of the eigenvalue problem, we end up to a solution, psi delta artifoc, which is an approximation to the f delta artifoc equal to zero equation, because what we solve actually is f delta artifoc applied to psi delta artifoc is equal to epsilon, where epsilon is small enough, arriving in the self-consistent field approximation and in the linear eigenvalue problem. So what we get at the end is f delta artifoc of psi delta artifoc equal to epsilon, where we note that we have three errors, the modeling error due to the artifoc, the discretization error due to the delta, and the fact that we have a solution error, as Geneviève explained, due to the self-consistent field and the approximation of the eigenvalue problem resulting into the epsilon. At this stage, the only wave function we are able to compute is the psi delta artifoc. So the size of the discrete space can be increased, the tolerance in the self-consistent field approximation can be diminished, the artifoc approximation is chosen. So we have an error which is a composition of these three contributions. Now we want to know how far we are from the exact Schrödinger equation. The exact Schrödinger wave function was implicitly known. So what is the result if we put the available psi delta artifoc in this implicit equation? This reads f of psi delta artifoc. This is not zero because there is no reason why psi delta artifoc would be the exact Schrödinger equation. This residual of the electronic Schrödinger equation is an indication of how far we are from the exact solution to this problem f psi equal to zero. Similarly, the psi delta artifoc was not the psi tilde delta artifoc because 
we add the solution error. So, F artifoc applied to Psi delta artifoc represent the error due to the solution, which is the residual of the artifoc model. These two residuals and more can be used in order to get an idea of the error we've committed by replacing the exact solution of the Schrödinger problem with the Psi delta artifoc. So the error between the exact solution Psi to the Schrödinger problem and the current available Psi delta artifoc is measured with the residual F of Psi delta artifoc. It is equal to the sum of three contributions. First, the modeling error, which is the difference between F of Psi delta artifoc minus F artifoc of Psi delta artifoc. Then comes the discretization error that tells that Psi delta artifoc is not the exact solution to the discrete artifoc problem. It is F artifoc of Psi delta artifoc minus F delta artifoc of Psi delta artifoc. And then comes the solution error, which is the Psi delta artifoc of Psi delta artifoc, because again, Psi delta artifoc is not Psi, psi tilde delta artifoc. At the end of this episode, we know how to get an approximation of the Schrödinger problem by solving approximately the discretized version of the artifoc problem. We have seen and proposed some method in order to compute the error between the exact solution and the solution from the discretized artifoc problem. We introduced the notion of modeling error, of discretization error, and of solution error. We should really have in mind these three notions in order to get some equilibrium among them. For instance, it would be silly to have a very fine discretization that results in a discretization error that is much smaller than the modeling error between the Schrödinger model and the Artifoc model. Similarly, it would be silly to iterate too much in the self-consistent field method or in the approximation of the eigenvalue problem if the discretization error would be too large. This could be the case if we use too few degrees of freedom, a uh, too small dimension in the discrete space. Once these three sources of error are detected and presented, it is an art to try to get an equilibrium between them. This is the art of numerical analysis. In order to set this art of the numerical analyst on firm ground, we need to introduce some mathematical notions that are known as a posteriori error estimate. But this is another story. In order to illustrate this concept, let us go back to our metaphor with our cat Erwin. The numerical resolution to the Schrödinger equation was like taking, saving, and printing a picture from our cat. We have identified different factors for the quality of these pictures. On one hand, we have the choice of the optical lens that we use in order to take the picture. This is equivalent to choosing a model, either the full Schrödinger or the Artifoc model. On the other hand, we have the pixelization of our picture in order to record it and maybe to print it. This is like doing the discretization of our equation. A few pixels is equivalent to taking few degrees of freedom in our discrete space. An important number of pixels is equivalent to having an important number of degrees of freedom in our discrete space. We see on this illustration various pixelization associated to two pictures of Erwin taken with two different cameras. On the left, an expensive camera has been used. On the right, a cheap one. 
We clearly see the difference if the level of pixelization is of different fineness. If we use less pixel, we see a degradation appearing immediately on the left. And it appears later for the picture on the right. This illustrates the fact that there is no point in using a too fine discretization with a cheap model. And symmetrically, if the level of affordable discretization is low, there is no use in buying an expensive camera. As said above, an equilibrium has to be reached between the different level of approximation. For a fixed budget, in our metaphor, we need to choose the proper camera with a given quality of the lens with what we can afford in order to do the pixelization. Now we have seen these different errors, we will try to improve the modeling error. We will see this in the next videos where we will explain how to get more precise models.